as we saw at the submission zero, wants to do some kind of volumetric lighting effect. And as our, our demo last, last year um, um, also facilitated volumetric lighting and I had some experience implementing it, I thought it would be nice to tell you my, my knowledge, what I gathered last year. The agenda for today is basically first some introduction, then the theory. This will be basically <coughs> the most important thing because I think if you know that, the rest is pretty easy. Then make it run and then make it run fast. Like making it run is, is, is important, but depending on your demo, it won't run fast enough because it has to run at 60 FPS. And then we will talk about making run fast and then some words about volumetric fog. Because if you have volumetric lighting, then the fog is just just three lines of code. Um, all right, volumetric lighting, what it is. Like, it has many, many meanings, uh, many, many um, words describing the same thing. I will call it volumetric lighting. In the slides, it will also call it sometimes VL. It's short for volumetric lighting, in case you didn't recognize that. <laughs> then there are God rays and light shafts. They are not exactly the same because God ray usually refer to the sun and light shafts also, but it's basically the same physical effect. Um, usually you have some light source. This is this nice light bulb. This light source emits some light waves and there is, then there is some media like dust, dead skin, something like that. And these particles um, either reflect the, the light somewhere else, which doesn't get to the eye, or they reflect somewhere else, then it gets again reflected, then it gets again reflected, and then into the eye, but just once or twice or don't know. And basically this process causes volumetric lighting. And then there is the camera or your eye or whatever sees it. And um, modeling this properly basically means you have some nice volumetric lighting effect. How to do that? Why to do that first? Like it's very used, very much used in practice. There are many games that use it. It's basically what defines the next gen look in my opinion. Um, here is skill zone, which, oops, wrong button, which looks very nice. Then there is crisis and then there's inside. Both three games um, use them very much. And uh, I think it's, it shows how, how important it is to keep it interesting the game. So what, what solutions are there? There are simple solutions with, which have been around for quite a long time. The simplest solution would be just to uh, use particles or billboards. Um, they look good for simple scenes but as, as soon as you get more complex then they fail miserably. So for example if you go into the light chest then usually they just blend out and it's not really good. Then the second variant, which is also used quite often, but only works for specific light sources, is when the um, light shafts or god rays are rendered in screen space. So basically the, the, the requirement for this is that the light source is actually visible on screen. Um, if, if, you're, if, if the scene that your demo or whatever um, has this, this um, meets, meets this criteria, then you can also use them. But from an implementation perspective, they are quite boring. So I, I would recommend you the other one because there you learn something interesting. So what we need, we need a more flexible approach. Yeah, this is like now the theory part. We look at the radiative transport equation, radiative transport equation for some ray XS. This some um, very intelligent physicist um, came up with, which which is very interesting <laughs> and what we basically need is we need the change of radiance, change of light radiance. This consists of the background radiance basically and the glowing medium. And this, in, in this, this edit is basically the change of radiance. This is the formula. We will dissect it further. Um, there is this little tau here, this one and that one. Um, this is the, basically the density describing the probability of collision in a unit distance. So that's quite complicated, but, but in a nutshell, if tau is much greater than 1, then it's hard to see through. And if tau is much um, lower than 1, then it's easy to see through. And it basically, basically describes the thickness of the medium you want to model. Then there is this A, this albedo that equal, equals to the probability of scattering after collision. So once it collides, what is the probability to scatter, so to not get into the eye of the viewer? 
Then there is this L of x s omega, which is this one here. And this is the change of regions along the ray we are talking about. Uh, the problem is, do we really know it? Um, spoiler alert, we don't know yet. Um, then there is this p omega prime omega, which is basically the, the phase function describing the probability density of the scattering direction. So basically, in which direction does the rays get scattered once it collides with something? Um, we will only consider single scattering, so this will be not that uh, for dif difficult phase function. All right. For performance reasons, we will consider only single scattering. There are statistical uh, approximations, but we will just look at single scattering because it's easier. And if we do that, then this nice big integral um, gets reduced to Li, which is just some function we will sample. And yeah, basically the change of radians is this term plus this term, which is um, the function, which is the in scattering term. All right. Um, this other term, which I just said, uh, this term, um, we, we can model it. it. It's usually pretty easy to do that. It's the background radiance. But for simplicity for this, for, this, um, for this presentation, I will just ignore it. It's not physically based, but you can add it afterwards. Um, it's, not very easy, uh, it's not very difficult. And, and, I will, in, and then it gets really easy. Then we just have and the change of radiance is just this simple Lis omega. Okay, now we have to change, but we actually need the the the, the um, we actually need the, not the change. We need the actual light radiance. So what to do is basically we transform this from this big integral into this Riemann summation after we solved it analytically. We basically inserted our phase function, which is just a simple um, exponential fallout, and then this L of i. And once we have this integral, we use a Riemann summation to approximate it. Um, this n is basically the um, number of samples, so the higher your n, the more accurate it gets, but the more um, computational intensity it is to calculate. Let's look at it in more, de more detail. The s, which is basically this one is the total ray marching distance. So how, how far um, do we ray march? In the worst case, if you implement it, it's the near plane to the far plane. Um, the delta L is the step size. It's basically um, um, how much does the uh, ray um, um, go move, move forward per ray step, a ray marching step. And then there is the LN. The LN is the traffic distance on the race. It basically says how much have we got or gotten already. And then this is the oops, wrong button. And this is the exponential fallout, which I was talking previously. It's the absorption, fa absorption factor. Okay, what now? Now we need to get this LI, which I just said is the in scattering term. Um, this is some nice formula some physicists came up with. Um, the VX is the visibility term. It's basically what you get from shadow mapping. Zero if it's in shadow and one if it's not in shadow. Um, this phi is the light strength. The higher, the more strength your light has. And this is the distance, the D is the distance to the light source, um, which basically says, okay, um, how far are we away from the light source? And yeah. Now, in a, now, now on a more high level um, view, what what's this all about? Basically, we want to um, we want to ray march for each fragment from the position of the current fragment in, li in, in in light space. Basically, let's say this position. We want to ray march towards the camera and and sample this um, li which I talked previously for each position. And if you do this for every fragment. Basically, we um, get the volumetric lighting at this fragment we are talking about. Uh, yeah, and this is the this is the light source I've been talking about. These are some occluders that occlude the, um, the light. And after doing this, what I told you, I told you, then we have what we want. That's about. Let's talk some code. Um, I omitted all the uniform stuff and the setup because it's pretty straightforward. Um, this is the ray marching um, process. Basically, what we do is we start at the uh, we start at the um, 
back of our array margin, like the distance in world space, until uh, as long as the, the distance we've, we've gone um, is greater than, we, than one step, and we, already, we, we decrement it um, once every, every, every iteration. Then we calculate the ray position in light clip space, so we can um, sample the shadow map, which is basically just normal shadow mapping, and we get this shadow term or visibility term. After that, we calculate the distance in world space. So basically the ray position in world space minus the light position in world space. And then the DRCP equals, um, whoops, wrong button. And then we basically take the inverse of D because it's faster to um, do it once and then use it um, just like that. Uh, because GPUs are not that fast at division, but much faster in, in multiplication. And this, this, the, whoops, I'm very bad at this. And, and this um, gets executed multiple times per fragment, so you want to optimize this. And yeah, basically what we do here is calculating the light contribution by inserting our values into this um, Li in scattering term, which I told you before. And then we continue, continue the ray marching. And now is the question, why do we ray march in light view and world space? Do you have any idea why? Like we could also just go through light space or just world space. The reason for that is because we want to be as fast as possible is to um, reduce the number of matrix multiplications inside this for loop as much as possible. And if you do it once, the calculation to get into light space and, and, and world space, we can um, omit this one matrix multiplication per, per, per array per step. And this makes it a, it a little bit more performant. Yeah. Um, this is how it can look. It's, it's using not um, directional light, which I've been talking um, about now. It's using um, um, sp um, spotlights and um, point lights, but basically it's the same. This is how it can look for directional light. And yeah, now we have the um, basic implementation, like we can sample it and we have some results, but it looks many samples to look good. Like um, um, if you want to optimize it if, if it, if you don't optimize it, you can get up to 128 samples per fragment and you have some overdraw. So you have, you have to do it multiple times in the in worst case. And if you optimize it, for example, you can get it to 22 samples for this um, point land or to 32 samples for this um, spotlight there. The solution for this is, of course, make it post-processing because if you have it in the post-processing step, then you don't have the overdraw and can do more fancy stuff. Now I'm going to talk about it a little bit more high level. And the first um, optimization will be to reduce the, um, stun, um, the, the fra fragments you need to ray merge through. Basically, this is done by downsampling the depth buffer, because if you sample the entire depth buffer, um, it doesn't really make that much difference to do it on half resolution, because the effect, the effect has a low, low is, is quite low frequency, so there, there won't be any visible problems with using this approach. The approach is pretty simple. You basically render the scene normally, render the depth buff, the, the render the depth and the textures to a frame buffer object. Then you downsample the depth buffer to half resolution. So again, to minimize the number of samples, um, you have to be um, you have to make sure that you don't just scale down the depth buffer because if you do that, the depth buffer doesn't really control depth because the depth buffer. Um, and contains um, the depth and not pixels or something. And what you have to do instead is to use either the minimum um, depth per, per, per texel or some, some maximum depth or checkerboard pattern, depending on what you want to do. I use the checkerboard pattern, which um, worked pretty nice. It doesn't make sense to interpolate the depth. Um, what you can also do instead is render your scene twice, once for the full resolution and once for half resolution, but then you have to render a scene twice, which is also not what you want. So I stick, stick with this solution. Then you render your volumetric lighting as before, 
Um, now you have to reconstruct your work positions in, from the depth buffer, which is in the appendix how you do that, how you can do that. There are multiple ways, but you have to know that you don't have the actual work positions anymore. And then, once you've done it, you can upsample this again and use nearest step upsampling. There are also lots of articles about this in the internet. All right. Now it works. If you if you are lucky, then it will work, and you will hit your 60 FPS you wanted. But if you still have not enough, uh, your performance still not well enough, um, you can use. You can further use the fact that the um, effect is very um, low resolution by introducing dithering. Uh, by using dithering, is basically you, you um, change the starting position of each um, ray by a little bit and, and use the fact that it's not, um, not, not high frequency and apply some Gaussian blur afterwards. Um, by, by doing that, basically, um, you, you reduce the number of samples and you um, have the effect still looking pretty nice because the Gaussian blur basically removes the, uh, the problems um, um, introduced by dithering. You have to be um, cautious because, again, it's depth values we are comparing, so doing the Gaussian blur um, using bilateral blur is much more um, recommended. And yeah, even though it's theoretically not separable, this bilateral blur in, instead of the Gaussian um, blur, where you usually you basically do one horizontal step and one um, vertical step to um, avoid to, to 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 reduce the number of samples. Here you still do it even though it's mathematically speaking not separable. Yeah, and then you can upsample as as previous again. Um, how is this dithering done? Um, there is some dither pat dithering pattern. Um, you can use either some array or some texture or something else. Um, and basically just um, change basi um, based on the current fragment, x and y coordinates, the positions of your light view and your workspace coordinates by multiplied with the step size. Okay, now I told you about volumetric fog. Um, volumetric fog is basically just sampling some 3D texture or 3D function which looks like a fog and adding it to the light contribution multiplied by what you got before. And if you do that, you have some nice uh, volumetric fog. Yeah, do we have some questions? Okay, um, some sources are used during implementation. Then the, here's this one, which is a Unity implementation for volumetric lighting. Um, if you know CG and Unity, it's a pretty good source. Um, and I kind of um, based my implementation off of this. Um, then there are some there is some quite nice blog post where the stithering pattern was explained, and get generally a good guide. Then this is a talk about insight where some some good parts of it were um, were about the volumetric lighting, and then this YouTube video was for the radio transport equation if you want to understand it even better. Then, oops, wrong button again. Then there is another talk about volumetric lighting, which is also quite nice, but again, it's, it's based on um, HSLS, HSL, so it's not um, GLSL. And then this is our implementation of, of volumetric lighting on GitHub. And this is the paper which all was based on. This is used in, I think, all basically as a base for all implementation of VL across um, all games. Yeah. And this is the appendix for calculating the work position from your depth buffer, which you will need if you do post-processing.